and welcome back to iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on social media at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Now, in the PropTech hot seat today is one of my favourite PropTech people, Anthony Slumbers. You're very welcome back to the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Long time no see. I know. I, I was actually thinking this is possibly one of the longest times I've gone without talking to you about PropTech, which is strange because there's so much happening in PropTech. So tell me, what are you involved in? What kind of work are you involved in? Or what have you been doing over the last few months? Well, it's quite interesting, actually, because the, the couple of years before before COVID started, I was doing a lot of uh, public speaking all, all, all around all around the place. And then that, that, that obviously died died during COVID. And I did quite a bit online, but not, not much in real life. But the in real life stuff has, has started up quite a bit. So... In the, la in the last few weeks, I've been to Copenhagen a couple of times, Berlin. I went to Tirana in Albania la last, last week. Um, so you've got quite a, quite a lot of things are all popping up. And it's, uh, it's actually really, really nice to be getting out and um, seeing, seeing people again. And uh, there, there, there's, something, there's, there's something magical of actually about a, re a really good conference or net network, networking session. I mean, there's, there's lots of talk of, Oh well, we'll never go back. We'll never go back to them. But you know, it really doesn't. You 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 cannot compete with a really well organized event that manages to pull together really interesting people in the audience and speaking. Now, obviously, they're, they're, this is all with the big the big caveat that they've got to be really interesting people. But if you get really interesting people in the audience and um, and and speaking, it's a it's an absolute um, you know tsunami tsunami of knowledge and information and insight you can ingest in the in no time at all. And apart from anything else, we're in the real estate industry, so we should like real estate. So we should like going and looking at real estate. I like cities. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that, that's a fair point. You know, when you talk about really interesting people, you know, the truth is, I don't think I've ever had a a, a genuine conversation with somebody that I didn't find interesting. The reality is everybody's interesting when you actually take the time to chat to them. And particularly if they're coming to a conference like that, because they've got some bit of a background in or, or knowledge of or interest in real estate. And there's always something to be learned because you're talking about people, not only in different sectors, but with different clients um, in different geographic areas. And so actually I, I you're right. They, you know, it's great when you can get these people together, but I've never spoken to somebody at a conference where I didn't learn something from them. It, it, well, it, it, and I don't just mean the speakers. No, I think that's true because they, every, everyone's coming from their own their own angle, aren't they? And and particularly within the, within the world of prop tech, prop tech people spend too much time with prop tech people, and and we we genuinely do spend too much time talk, talking to each other. Um, and really, we need to get out get out a lot more and talk talk to our users, our stakeholders, our other suppliers, our funder, you know, all manner, all the other people within within our ecosystem, rather than you know, talk, talking nerdy stuff to nerdy stuff to to each other. And that, and that's what you can do in a conference, yeah. And you get yeah different attitudes, different angles. People look at things through different lenses. And you and a big problem, a big thing within in real within top tech, I think, is genuinely understanding what your customers issue is now I wasn't I was going to say problem but it's not necessarily problem um it's what would they like what would what would enable them to do more what would make their life easier what would make them more money what would save them money what would just be really nice to have and you need to we need to get out more and try harder to understand real wants needs and desires because I know I know what it's like I know what it's like as a as a as a techie, you think, oh, well, I can do this. This is really cool. But, you know, who cares? You know, you care because it's fun and it's interesting. But actually, your customer's not interested in that. What's your customer really interested in? You know, you, you've touched on something that we became aware of maybe in the last two years that there was, as the prop tech ecosystem was growing globally, um, we were talking to each other about the importance of real estate not being in silos where it's actually PropTech was this <laughs> growing silo. And actually it's something that we again became aware of really in the early days of COVID that actually 
when we talk to people who need digital solutions really quite quickly um, at the start of the pandemic and they, as restrictions were starting to kick in, they didn't know what was out there. And my thought was, but we've been talking about this for years. How can you not know? And really, I realized that we had just been talking to each other that actually PropTech had become a very large echo chamber where we talk about the danger of silos. And, you know, it, it's like the lobster in the pot not, not realising uh, the water's heating up. And so actually we pull back a little bit from there. And in fact, in Ireland, what we did was we um, stopped a lot of our uh, prop tech events and introduced prop tech into mainstream real estate events. And that's been much more successful. So, for example, this year was the first year that actually we got prop tech as a standalone category in one of the national property business awards yeah, um, right, and so yeah. that was, you know actually it's ridiculous that it's taken so long but you know now now it's there and look the real hallmark of success is when we don't need to talk about property as distinct from real estate but we're a few years off that yet but you're absolutely right you know we've been we've been preaching to the choir a certain amount um and actually covid has opened up this this um willingness in the industry to listen you know you and i we've talked a lot about um the technology can only do so much that actually the culture needs to shift for people to be amenable to the technology where it's actually um you know covid obviously has been a huge driver but actually um esg and sustainability uh um i suppose guidelines that designers and real estate operators have to hit if we're honest i think we'd say they've been the the biggest drivers what do you think i i i, I couldn't i couldn't agree in agree more and it, it's interesting though when you, when you talk when you talk about about sustainability that we were we were mentioning earlier that uh, certain vcs are sort of prophesying oh pop takes in the in the in the doldrums it's in the recession and and what have you and i just think oh my god you open open your eyes open your eyes do you not see how the in the rise in the importance of sustainability which is absolute, absolutely crit critical now. I mean, just, you know, just quickly, in, in my area, it's more to do with, uh, with offices. So one, one of the most important things in, in offices from now on is that we now know, because of the pandemic, um, that if you put lots of people in a, in, a, in a space which is badly ventilated and you insert a virus, you can kill a lot of people. We know this. So buildings can genuinely harm you. And we've known this for decades, but the last two years have actually have, have absolutely made us wake up and go, oh, well, hang on, well, we really need to take, take it seriously, don't we? Now, one of the ways, well, part of the way to make a building healthy is it has to be a sustainable building. To enable a sustainable building requires a lot of technology. And so in, to enable a building to be sustainable is actually also enabling buildings to be healthy and productive because to be able to create the right sorts of environments within buildings only comes from the technology that you need to use to help you build a sustainable building. And I heard a great, a great phrase at, a, um, at an event earlier in the year, which I have shamelessly stolen and I use as a slide in one of, one of my talks, that says sustainability is the mechanism by which prop tech will be inserted into real estate. And it's a blindingly strong ar argument. Yeah. We have to be building sustainable buildings. Not only do we have to be building sustainable buildings, frankly, we need to stop building buildings. We need to be, we need to be refur refurbishing and renovating what we already have. What's the, what's the, 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 the stance? Something like 80% of what, of the buildings that will be around in 2050 are already existing and we need to decarbonize all, all, all of them. So this is a major, this is the biggest, the biggest thing in real, in real estate, and will be for a, a long, long time. Now, to do that is going to require an awful lot of technology, and that game is really hotting up now. So, for any anyone in in the prop tech industry to saying, "Oh, we're going into recession," completely misunderstands the nature of the industry. The the industry is in desperate need. And I mean need now of technology to help it de decarbonize. And the other good points about um, technology, enabling happy, happy buildings, productivity, and, and all the rest, will come 
as a almost as a byproduct from concentrating on 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 sustain sustainability and you know the, the last the last couple last couple of years have really emphasized that point and of course again in the in the commercial sector the last couple of years has fundamentally and forever decoupled the connection between work and the office we we, we now know and we have two 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 years evidence that actually you don't need an office to work that's not saying you don't want one but you don't need one and when your customer is moving from someone who needs your product to someone who has to be made to want your product you're in a you're in a very different industry so as an industry now i'm, to, I'm talking com commercial here particularly particularly off uh, the office market to be successful in the office market now you have to create a product which genuinely is a product market fit for your for your customer and is something your customer wants and enables them to do to to do things that they can't do without your product and if you don't do that you you're really going to be in problem so you've got these two monster drivers of change one that the industry cannot just sit there and wait for someone to come and take their product because they don't need it anymore and the, and the whole sustain the sustainability issue and all the the health health and wellness because of the virus and you've never had such strong drivers behind the prop tech industry so i would say now i mean how long i've been in prop tech as it were since 1995 i would say today it's the <coughs> today is the best time ever to be into prop tech yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a really fair point. And before we started recording, you and I were having a conversation about the metaverse. And one question or one word we kept coming back to was why. And I think in prop tech, sometimes the why was missing. So, for example, there was cool technology out there that could do stuff and it would make things better. But the why wasn't compelling enough because there are so many problems, not all problems need or deserve or are viable. To, to address through technology. So yes, technology can make them better, but actually there are better ways to use technology or to, or to spend resources. But actually, I think the why for PropTech now is suddenly very clear and the why is sustainability. So I, I think that people, depending on their level of uh, cynicism, will talk about the drivers as to why that is, but the reality is uh, sustainability, is driving prop tech adoption. So whether it's because of regulatory um, regulatory requirements, whether it's because of financing requirements, it, it, that all, um, almost doesn't matter. The reality is that the real estate community, it's probably the one thing that they have been, that they've agreed upon in, in my decades in the industry. And that is sustainability. It's not, it's not a tick box exercise. Um, this is the, this is the direction we need to go this is the only way to still be doing to still be in this business in a decade's time that's it, not compelling it, it, well it is, it is it is compelling and but what is what is so positive about the current environment is that we've actually aligned aligned incentives you know investors regulators and occupiers historically within real estate had different incentives they were trying to achieve different things now all the incentives are aligned investors you will not you will not fund anything that is not sustainable now because the investors themselves where they're getting their money from which they invest with you are being told to invest in sustainable stuff you have regulators with increasingly big carrots carrots and stick saying well they, there's lots of good reasons for you to do this and if you if you you know if you're a good boy or girl we'll give you this um but they've got increasingly big sticks as well. If you don't do it, we're going to start hitting you on the head. On, on the head. Um, and you've got the best customers are also de demanding it. So you talk to any, any serious occupier in the commercial sector and try and, try and sell, them a, sell them or lease them a building that is not very high up the sustainability. You just won't do it. Yeah. So you've aligned the incentives. And once you align incentives, everything starts to act as a flywheel for, for everything else. And then you can really motor. Yeah, that, that's a really great point. Uh, 
Anthony, you're you're credited with coining the term space as a service. Now, I, there was a growing um, understanding or acknowledgement for the need for commercial real estate to be flexible prior to the pandemic. But since then, it's it's a it's right up there, uh, not quite with sustainability, but almost. So flexibility, how is our current stock of real estate capable of being managed profitably, sustainably and flexibly? Um, no. But that's a that's a bug in the feature, depending where, where, where you are in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the in the system a lot of a, a lot of buildings are not going to be able to be very very sustainable or aren't very very sustainable a lot of buildings don't have a lot of flex, flexibility built, built built into them um and a lot of the way institutionally we operate buildings is not is not very flex is not very flexible um but the the demand the the demand is all is all for flexibility. You know, there's there's so much sort of um, you know, sturm und drang going on at the moment between oh, employers say get back in the office and employees go no no and, and all this. But it it's all frankly a bit irrelevant because frankly talent is going to win on this game, but because ultimately talent talent wants flexibility, and if you're trying to attract and retain um, the, the, the the best talent. You're going to have to give them give them flexibility because they, talent has optionality now nowadays. You know, the really really good talent is always somewhere else it can go, and if you don't give flexibility, some some someone else will. But the interesting thing about flexibility is it's across three three vectors. There's there's flexibility of time, so. What what is it? It's a strange convention that we all go to work at you know the old nine to five. We've done that for mainly because that's when the you know the sun was up and the sun was down or the factory was open. So let's go to the office that time. A lot of people work earlier. A lot of people work later. A lot of people would like to take the children to school. Would like to take to pick their kids up, kids up from school and you know more you know more for the more for the day. So we're going to need to offer more flexibility time. Flexibility of location, in that really the 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 way we work now is via a, net, a network network of a network of spaces. You know, we might work a bit at home, bit in the office, bit in a, a co-working space, bit in a hotel, bit in a, you know lots lots of lots of different places. So we want to be able to work in lots of different locations, and then flexibility <coughs> flexibility of space itself, so that dependent upon my particular job to be done now, I need this type of space. When I have a different task to do, I could perform that task best in a different type of space. So an ideal, an ideal building will, and workplace will be an, able to, an, um, to facilitate people with the right type of space for the, for the job to be done that they have they have they have to do so you need flexibility of location flexibility of time and flexibility of of space and so much of this involves a rethinking of how, how we think about our buildings and how we think about our space and it gets very interesting on the on the on the design side you know how do we start designing designing our spaces for sort of emergent emergent behavior we don't really know how we're going to use the space over the next eight, X number of months or years, but if you have a space that you can easily recon reconfigure it, everything that's fixed needs needs to needs to become flexible. Now, this is a this is this is very clearly a bug for the lot of the industry that's not set up to either think like this, operate like this, or have or actually has the assets that can enable this sort of behavior. For them, that's a bad thing. For the for the ones that do think. How do I make my space more flexible? How do we operate more flexibly and have the spaces that enable them to do that? I mean, this is very, very clearly a feature. This is this is a good thing because the demand there's going to be. I think there's going to be huge demand 
for the, in commas, the right type of space operated in the right way. And that space is going to do incredibly well, largely because there's not going to be that much of it. Because this is a whole new skill set the industry is starting, starting to learn. You know, we're becoming, this is the point about space as a service, we're becoming a service industry. We're moving from selling a product to delivering a service. And a service industry is different from a product industry. And it goes back to that want to need. A product industry is you make stuff people need. A service industry, you make stuff people want. And, and I, I, I have this phrase I use that I say, um, you know, the real estate industry is no longer in the, in the business of fulfilling demand. It's about creating desire. Yeah. So in the market we're going into now, I want people to say, I want to be in your building. Yeah. But my building's really expensive. I don't care. I want to be in your building. Why? Because your building understands me and is prepared to optimize itself to enable me to be the best version of me, enable me to be as good as I possibly can be. And that's what and that's what I want. But you could go next door, it's the same building. Yes, but it's not operated in the same way. So I can't get that. And they don't pay, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get to the stage of separating square footage from price. So we're not going to be selling real estate based on square footage. We're going to sell, be selling it based around productivity. I'm not selling you um, office space. I'm selling you a productive workforce. What really, you know, we, we, within the real estate industry, uh, so obviously in the office market, we think, well, what are we doing? Well, we're, our customers want offices. Our customers don't want offices. That's, they want productive workforces. They just, that's just where you tended to put productive workforces. And so we've got a sort of a, a, a category error that we've, what we thought we were selling is actually not what our customer wants. So our customers want productive workforces. Now, what does, what does that mean? Oh, well, do we give them a, an HQ office? Well, maybe, but probably a lot less so than you used to. You probably give them some sort of complete package. You know, can I, can I manage all your real estate needs from your HQ building to your co-working spaces to, I'll look after your work from home stuff as well. You know, there's, it's a, it's a very different, much, much more client, customer centric, um industry we're we're becoming which is yeah. what, what i think is sorry this is just just the last point because i know i'm going on why, why i think this is so important is because the the industry is open for new products new ways of thinking new business models and for imaginative creative innovative real estate people there's never been a time like it because if you go back 20 years and you went to the industry, all you could do is produce the same as, you know, if someone said, well, what's the best? Oh, well, that's the best, just go and build that. Now, now you, you have the opportunity and there's gonna, be, there's gonna be new companies developing with new innovators and create, creative real estate people putting together new packages, new form factors, new buildings, and they're gonna be able to sell those in a way that they would never have been able to do before so again going back to if you want to don't don't do a downer on, on on the industry at the moment it's unbelievably positive no i listen <laughs> you've convinced me after you've convinced me but no I, look i i think all of this is is being packaged up um in a more experiential way and something that we've seen in retail it's something that we've seen in classes of residential like the bill to rent but you know and, and you know when you're talking about the different types of flexibility um, I think we also have to factor in that actually people have changed. So actually the flexibility that people wanted prior to COVID is different to what they want post COVID. So for example, in our Dublin office, we used to have three clocks hanging on the wall for because we had um, clients across three time zones. Um, in our Galway office, which is in the heart of the Gaeltacht area, so we're, we're by the sea and everything, um, in our Galway office, we had one clock on the wall. We took that down and we replaced it with a tide clock. So yeah. now we always know when we're coming towards or away from high tide. So we know the right time to take a break or have a team meeting on the beach or have a walk on the beach. Just 
do you know to check emails or deal with social media so actually fantastic flexibility so you're right when you break down the flexibility but i think even that has changed from what we thought flexibility would be prior yes, to what, yeah. what it is now so from the time <clears throat> we were talking about this two and three and four and five years ago to now how has that changed based on what you're hearing from your customers I th- I think it. I think it just has changed. You know, the whole everything has everything that we talked about five years ago. Essentially, is slowly, slowly coming coming true. I mean, it's like slightly this thing. Oh, have you got a new idea? Because that was what you were talking about five years ago. Yeah, but it's it's still it's still correct. It's just taking you know take 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 takes a while a, a while a while to happen. Um, I th- I think fundamentally. It's very interesting what you what you say there because that, that's an example of 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 in, individ, individual needs, and and this is one one of the things I think the real estate industry is going to have to become really really good at understanding what the individual needs needs are of of people much in a much broader broader sense than 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 real than real estate, and I, I, yeah. I, I, th- I, th- I think it just is moving in, you know, we've taken, the last two years has been a bigger, a bigger shock than, I think we're waking, waking up to actually how it's been a bigger, had a bigger impact than, than, than we think, you know, lots of people talk about it's been an acceleration of things that are going, going on, but, it, but it's not really, this is much, is much more like a, a revolution, a revolutionary, you're rethinking about how we want to work, where, where we want, want to work, and we we have a freedom now to 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 re to rethink everything, which probably would not have existed before. And very definitely, we're moving from a world where there's work and there's leisure, and there's shopping, uh, retail, and then there's and then there's home. To well, you know, I mean, we've all been at home for two years. So what's an office? Well, office is a home. What's a home? Well, home is an office as well. What's a hotel? Well, that's partly an office as well. I think all these things, all these things are merging, and I, I think we're, we're, we're going to find asset classes. The whole notion of asset classes are going to sort of morph, which is, which I think is going to become very interesting. Um, and 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 then just a, just a, a slightly de- detour, particularly because I think this is a, a, a relevant thing for. For Ireland, considering considering the housing pressures in Dublin, I know there's quite a lot of moves to try and distribute work around the country. Um, but really should, it <laughs> really really should, um, because it's an op- it's an opportunity to do it, isn't it? And and you can see you can see a lot of opportunities to and- op- op- opportunities to do that. Anthony, something in Ireland happened that I was just so delighted to see because I grew up on a farm uh, and as soon as I had the opportunity I went back to live in a field on the farm where the noisiest thing around me are donkeys and um, but, but something happened that surprised economists but it shouldn't have and that is the minute city living became not as affordable it was not as attractive and as soon as people had a choice as in wi-fi enabled them to do their job uh, or broadband uh, enable them to do their job elsewhere. People in their droves chose elsewhere to the point where now our government have um, implemented or, or they've just introduced a new scheme for a 50,000 euro grant for home buyers who will renovate and bring back to life um, uh, old derelict properties in towns and villages in rural Ireland. So yeah. actually, and, and this this is something that I I, I truly believed for for um, throughout the conversation um, moving towards uh, in urban planning that Irish people, most the majority of Irish people are still within one or two generations off the land. And it was too soon to expect people to live in apartments that weren't well designed for community, that weren't well designed yeah. and integrated for outdoor space. And we rushed that and we did it very badly. So for example, I've lived in an apartment in Spain. It was fabulous. Do you know, it was one yeah. of the best I've ever lived. 
apartments in Ireland are not like that. They're badly built. There's no storage. There was no bicycle. There was no pushchair storage yeah. anything like that. They weren't accessible. Um, they weren't centered on community. The very opposite. They were trying to bring privacy into places that shut out community. So actually, what this did is it actually made our policymakers sit up and realize, hold on, Irish people are not necessarily ready to live in two bed apartments that aren't well designed, that aren't um, mean, that, that, that don't make family life attractive. And the minute they, they could, they were heading off to places like Roscommon and Tipperary and everywhere around the coast in Ireland. Um, so actually, what this tells me is that our urban planning policies moved too quickly. For the, for the Irish psyche, and I don't know what it's like in other countries, um, but we're seeing this huge return to urban, a, a desire to return to urban, or sorry, to rural life. And that's really exciting for all the rural villages because we're seeing co-working spaces, coffee shops, all of these new businesses, creative hubs popping up that have never been there before. And I'm so excited about it. So I think beyond technology, beyond urban planning, I, I think this is a really exciting time for the citizens of a place to use their voice and say, actually, this is this is how you can change. That's so exciting for me. Yeah, no, I, I'm a hundred percent with you because it's it, you know, it, 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 it's a quality it's a quality of life a quality of life life thing, isn't it? And we have the capabilities of of of, of doing it, and so and certain places in Ireland is is, is one of them because of its. It's geography. Even if you're on the other side of the country, you're still not far that far. You can still get to Dublin if you need to get to Dublin within a couple of hours, a couple of hours. It's not like it's not like a big deal. So the whole the whole country can can be a, um, a, a can can be your 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 tennis pitch as a, as it were. So yeah, I'm, but, but but this is exactly what I'm, what I mean. This is this is where a lot of the the new new products and new services and new business models are going to come from people thinking well how do we do that maybe maybe it's not just renovating one building maybe we need to do you know let's get i mean, I mean they're doing it they're even doing it in 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 italy where they're giving grants to take over complete villages yeah that have been empty for you know god god knows how long because they just didn't make any any sense but so you turn turn them into a combination of you know Live, live, work, tourism, hospitality, and you know, there's all there's all manner of. Well, when, once once you've removed that constraint, which is what has happened over the last couple of years, exactly what you're talking about becomes possible. And once you remove that constraint, what becomes possible is down down to people's imagine imagination. Because I don't I don't think money's going to be a problem. There's still plenty, you know. Yeah. My, Property is always going to be a good place to end up sticking your money because there's only a certain number of places that you can put, put money. Um, so there's going to be plenty, plenty, plenty of money around, plenty of opportunity, opportunity around. And re really, in, ter in terms of concentrating on how, how do you enable people to be as productive as possible? So if you just take a pure Adam Smith version of this, all we want is people to be as productive as possible. Well, funny enough, if you make people help help people be healthy and happy, they're going to be more productive. So there's a lot of advantages in actually concentrating on the soft stuff in order to get the, to get the um, the hard results. You know, to get the productivity, get the happiness and the health. I, I genuinely believe, though, the productivity is something that everybody. Uh, or sorry, the majority of people who are working from home reported that they were so much more productive because they had to be, they were compensating. However, creativity dropped. Um, Anthony, I'm so conscious of time. I know we have to wrap up. Before we finish, what are you most excited about in PropTech? Um, well, I, I, I am, I'm actually going to go, go back to good old space as a service because I'm launching my trillion dollar hashtag uh, space as a service course in the middle, middle of September. People can register in interest. It's not ready to sign up yet, but if you go to antonyslumbers.com, you can just, just re register interested in that. Because I think this whole notion of turning everything in real estate into, we are now a service industry. So whatever, whatever people want, what can we produce, produce for them? And then give me the technology for that. So start with the customer, work back to the te technology. So any, any technology that can enable people to be as 
have as much pleasure or be as productive as possible is a good thing. Anthony, I came, I, I came on this interview and I mentioned to you that I was starting to feel a little weary um, about the, <laughs> the, the, tech, uh, the tech adoption struggle. I have to say you provide my enthusiasm. Thank you so much. And I'd recommend so, anybody listening in just to go to Anthony's website. That's Anthony Slumbers, uh, A-N-T-O-N-Y, slumbers.com. Uh, and there's blogs, lots of thought leadership there, lots of things that will make you think and some artwork that will, that will certainly make you reflect on what you're reading so that's it from us this week you can get in touch with the show on social media at iProperty Radio or by emailing hello at iPropertyRadio.com. My thanks to Anthony and to our producer Breed Malloy and the Hear Me Roar production team and to Luke Delaney on sound for Dublin South FM. Until next time thank you for listening.